Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Two Lawyers Talking Law of One. My name is Virginia Robin. I am a modern shaman and lawyer and together with lawyer Geraldine Johns Putra, we are discussing the law of one and exploring what that might look like if the law of one as we knew it shifted toward a, an applying of a more unified unifying law of one into our systems today. This is a 10 part series in which we will see how the law of one could look as a solution to various societal questions. And today in this third episode, we're considering approaching our engagement with money from an energetic perspective and reflecting upon the relationship that money has with our societal systems. And my, for me, money has been and I think for most people, money is the makes the world go round. We learn about money from ch as children and what value we place on that. And for me, it is um, it for me it is very much a, a case of money didn't grow on trees. And I think many people grew up with the idea that money is a scarcity; it has to be earned, and it's it's something that's out there, separate from you, and that. You have to go and get it, and you have to earn it. It, it. it is you have to be valuable before you get it, and it identifies you with success and all those sorts of things. Well, I don't see it like that anymore. But how about you, Geraldine? What did what, what was your experience with money growing up? Uh, I I think I had a fairly uh, I would say typical. I mean, what is typical? Uh, background when it came to money so I didn't grow up in a disadvantaged household uh I didn't grow up in a very you know uh, abundant household either so it was the messages I got growing up were you know money like you said money doesn't grow on trees you know you be careful learn how to save so I had parents who were very much into saving and building for the future uh I had parents who invested in my education uh, which is, it's a little bit typical of um, my cultural background. I'm Malaysian by birth. And in in my parents' culture, it was very important to see their children uh, become professionals, you know, get a good university degree, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, a, it's a very typical story. So money was, it, money wasn't a, a, an aim in itself. It, was it was more about security and money it wasn't about hoarding lots of money it was making sure that we didn't starve and that was that's that's the message i got growing up that if you didn't get a solid secure um education and job uh that you you then would be out on the street and you know you that was my parents greatest worry coming from they came they were coming from a place of love so that's what i associate money with and i still you know, it's still a root issue. You know, it's still a very, very much a survival issue, um, but it's coming at it perhaps not from a from experiencing a lot of lack, but from experiencing from being told that it was an integral part of life. Yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? It's that this is the way it's always been. Don't question that. You need to follow these this set of rules. It worked for us, therefore it'll work for you. For me, yes, there was no um, my my upbringing was probably a little bit more uh, less prosperous, and yeah, everyone had things. So of course, I thought, oh, everyone gets love when they have things. So I want the things too. All my friends had shiny things, and I didn't have those things, and so that's what I strive for. I thought. These kids have got love, they've got everything, they've got all their friends because of the things. And so that's when I, I grew up and I thought, well, I can't follow traditional paths. I have to sort of go and earn money to get things so then people will love me. You know, I, I'll have the things too. And I think there's a, there's a lot of that still in society, I believe. Yeah, there's, a, there's that attachment. You know, I went through this phase. Uh, I My parents... Uh, gave me this messaging about, you know, security and, and a steady rise. And then I went through a phase that that was a rebellion against them, but not, not a classic rebellion of, um, 
I'm going to you know, take a job that you're not happy with, or I'm going to uh, walk away from this great uh, uh, steady career. What it was, was that I began to use money to fill a hole because mm. what had happened was that my parents, um, bless them, you know, they wanted the best for me. But in instilling in me that I had to follow a certain path, I went down that path basically for them, not for me, uh, even though I thought I wanted it. And, and so there was a void. And so I filled that void by spending a lot of money. My reaction was, I'm making money, now I get to spend it and show the world and myself that I am quote unquote successful. And so I went the other way and my parents didn't instill this in me. They would have preferred that I saved all of my money um, but I was spending it to to show myself to say, hey, you know, I've got all of these things now. Uh, it means I'm happy. So I, I got on this vicious cycle of earning, spending, earning, spending, earning, spending, and just just you know, kind of ultra consumerism, uh, which is another. Like, we're touching on many, many different stories around money in this conversation. You can just, you know, anyone who has a conversation around money and what it means to them, you'll find, you know, we could probably have dozens of different narratives around money and approaches to money. And that's why it's so interesting when like a couple might get together, um, they'll find that uh, they have th they have these different approaches to money and you know, digging into it will actually lead to reasons for, say, whatever conflict that they might be having in, in, in their lives. People yeah. have multiple approaches to money because money is so embedded in our, our needs, our dreams, our goals. Uh, it's, it, it, it's intertwined in the human psyche. Yeah, from that point of view, I believe too that it, it it's a got a representation of love love about it. It's it's money equals love value. Uh, you are valued and valuable because you can you can attract money. But so I I do I went through all that as well. You know, then I was able to buy all the shiny things for myself. And when I figured out, well, there's only so many shiny things I can have, and it's still not doing what I thought it would do. So it's like. Yeah, I've got all the shine. Do I do I have love now? Do I feel satisfied? Because it because from my point of view, the idea of love is a sense of peace and satisfaction. But we see people upgrading to the new thing, upgrading, upgrading, moving on, always reaching out for the next thing that will give them what they feel will be the love or the satisfaction. Or everyone will say, "Right, I've got there now. I I reached it. I got to where I'm supposed to be." But of course. When you, when you have a goal to get to a place, when you get there, you look around and think, oh, this isn't it. <laughs> and so that was me. You know, how many pairs of shoes could I have? How many, you know, my nice car and my beautiful home. I had, I had, I had a Ferrari. You know, I, had, I had all the cars. I had everything that you could possibly want in life until one day I got to that point. I looked around and I thought, oh, dear, no. This isn't it. The law practice, you know, a partner in a practice, everything, the status, the whole works. I could buy a jewellery, anything. Then what, is it, what did that mean to me? Um, and I, I, I believe that I, my journey had to be come from a place where I didn't have much or the shiny thing to find out that the shiny thing didn't have value at all. And so I questioned that one day. I looked around and I thought, I, I just if I let all of this go, you know, it was it was that understanding of now just letting the idea of all this go. This isn't where it's at. There's got to be something else. And that was a turning point for me, understanding what that meant. Yeah, it's, uh, it, this is actually what you're talking about is mirrors uh, the path for the collective, I believe. So we're going to have to actually start to, start to um, separate that's Rodney expressing himself Hi, Rodney. we're gonna have to start <laughs> separating the uh, our deep emotional attachment to money uh, you know all yes we all have individual stories around money but we're going to have to to stop uh, associating you know um, our uh, uh, creating conflict out of money um, seeing money as a need 
um, attaching different stories to money and begin to, to tell a different story collectively about money. Uh, because this is the way forward. I mean, we've built a society that, quote unquote, needs money. Um, uh, and it's kind of filling a collective void, right? Just like I was filling a void and you were filling a void. And then when you realized that you that um, money wasn't really deeply, wasn't permanently filling that void, that you had to fill it with something else, which was love. When we as a society collectively understand that we need to fill our voids with love uh, and not money and not the things that we buy with money, then we we will take the next leap forward. And that to me is the, the story of where we are now. Yeah, I agree. And But it took me to see, look at everything as I do now from an energetic perspective. So when I saw that money too is just an energy, it's exchanged for things. And, and when you're feeling enough, it, you tend to have enough. It's again, that, that idea of energy being frequency and flow. So you're in the flow with money. We, you know, some of us hoard money, we, we sort of bank it up and stockpile it and anything like that becomes stagnant and putrefies in, in effect, when you're looking at things from an energetic perspective. So money is necessary, but when we see it as an energy and it has a flow about it, then it can go to where it's needed. And if I need some, and this is really how I've lived my life, from, from that point where I let go of this idea of, oh, the things are going to make me get the love that I want, the satisfaction, the, 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 the beauty in my life, those things aren't the beauty. The beauty comes from my satisfaction. When I understood that, it was the ability to then say, okay, what do I actually need? What do I need in my life? Well, I just need enough. And that's a scary idea because people think, well, yeah, if I save my money, then there will be enough behind me in case something happens. But in case what happens? We can't predict these futures. And my experience has been when I ask for, can I just have enough to, um, for the next step? And when I have worked it that way, it's been really quite miraculous how the money will flow to me exactly. So I can, I think we talked about this, Geraldine, money to me is elastic. So mm. for example, recently I went through a family law matter and I just really asked, can I get enough out of this? Not what I deserve or what I need, which represented the love to me. You know, that's what a lot of people go and fight over money to say it represents my worth, but it doesn't actually Thanks, Trevor. Uh, Trevor from Brisbane is really enjoying this. Thanks, Trevor. Um, when the money represents my worth to me in a family law matter, then I'm going to fight for more because I think, well, you've got what's worth something to me. But no, that's not true. I just asked for enough. And when I got out of it, what is enough, even though perhaps in the family law system that wasn't the balance, it was sufficient for me then to move on and get exactly what else I needed. It's then the right thing came along for the right price and all those things kept flowing into my reality that was right for me, not for somebody else or what society thinks. So mm -hmm. this is the important change of how we, how I approach money now as I say, I'll always have enough for what I need. Yes, and what you're touching on is trust, right? So, so the, the association that so many of us have with money is some kind of fear. It's a, a fear of not having enough or sometimes, actually, it can be a fear of having the money and what it means to have the money. You know, it's that scarcity mindset of, uh, you know, I'm not used to having money, so as soon as I, I get money, I, I need to somehow get rid of it, which is why some people actually find that they, even if they land in a situation where they have a lot of money, they win Ted's lotto or something, yeah. they, end up, they end up losing it. Why? Because they have this idea, this deep-seated idea that they don't, they don't, they shouldn't have money or they don't deserve money. You also get it with um, artists who feel like they shouldn't be associating their output, their creative output, with the grubbiness of money. Um, I've been through a version of it myself where I have had difficulty charging people for work. Um, because I feel like it, it, the work that I do that is pro bono is somehow more noble 
And as soon as I put a price tag on it, then you know it changes the relationship. Yeah. So there, there's so much fear around money. And actually, what that what that it means is that anyone who controls money controls us. Yeah. And that is a, yeah. another story of money that we need to move out of. Because as soon as we have trust that there's always going to be money, uh, that we're, there's abundance, which is what all of this, you know, abundance thinking and law of attraction, which is part of our journey as a collective, was leading us to, even though we're now moving beyond that kind of materialistic, I need, I need the big car, I need the big house, we're moving beyond it. But it was an important part of our journey to go through that whole understanding of the law of attraction because we need to have that trust so that we can move beyond the basically the matrix you know where we're stuck in jobs we hate because we think i, I need to make the money the money <laughs> And yeah. that's prostitution the, the, basically that's prostituting yourself just saying yeah i'll sell my soul for some money yeah exactly <laughs> Um, and the great thing about you know, the the lessons of the law of abundance and the law of attraction is that uh, I went through it also. You know, I had a phase where I left a job, and for a year and a half, I somehow I somehow made money, um, and that was a, a a big lesson for me because the second time around, when I decided I needed to leave the job that I was with. I had some lessons and I also had the back of my mind, I got through that then. I can get through this. You know, I'll, I'll never starve, basically. And I think collectively we're going through that same realization that it is possible. It is possible to step out of the matrix. It's possible to design a life that we love, not um, sitting there and imagining the $10 million paycheck or whatever it is, but sitting there and imagining you know, just deep-seated alignment and joy. And that's yeah. that's mm. really important as a collective, I think, to move away from you, the control of money. You are so right money. about that, that, that yeah, the deep-seated alignment. It is if I feel satisfied, then I animate everything that's satisfying to me. This is an abundant universe. If you have the feeling of satisfaction, you get satisfaction. But if you have yes. this feeling of scarcity in your body, what do you get? Scarcity. I see there isn't enough. So it's really the feeling body. And this is what I'm always saying now is that it because feeling it, it's all an energy. If you're feeling like you're in the place where you want to be, then you are. You know, it, it seems self-evident. But if yeah. you think something is bad, it is bad. That is your life. It will be bad because you're seeing it that way. And it's the same, what, you, what you're saying before about, for example, the spiritual community. People are afraid to charge decent money for their services. And they're offering brilliant services because they say, well, it's not spiritual. Well, who said? Money is energy. <laughs> all that is is all that is, which includes money. Like everything else, it's the value that you place upon it. So if as a child money caused your family to break apart or was it the source of everything unhappy in your life, that's your work. That is your work to say money is neutral. Money is just a means of transacting. And I can feel abundant or be abundant by, say, just um, I'm going somewhere and someone says, oh, here's a whole lot of oranges. How, you know, would you like those? Oh, yes, thank you. You know, that is an abundance as well. We have just given this identity to money that the collective keeps reinforcing yeah absolutely this is the this is the uh, one of the challenges right of um uh moving into a space of you know, clearing all of our concerns about money it's the the reinforcement around us that we have to we have to continually continually remind ourselves that we are entirely capable uh, of creating our own abundance or creating, as you said it earlier, trust, trusting that we can get what we need when we need it. So don't ask for you know, more than you need. Ask for what you reasonably need and go forward. But everyone around us, and you know, we're a couple of lawyers, so we can relate this to, to the law. Our lawyers will advise us, look, you're entitled to, to X sum. So go for X sum. And in the, in, the, in the course of getting X sum, you, we will churn through feelings of scarcity, fear, conflict, 
you know, creating lots of ripples of negative energy that have whatever consequences, um, rather than uh, trusting that you know, we just need that much. And so, yes, I totally agree. The, 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 this is why I think it's important to, as we're moving through these individual journeys, to connect, you know, like you and I connect, connect with people around us who are going to reinforce uh, that we can trust, trust ourselves and trust the universe uh, and, and switch off, switch off from, you know, like I, I'm sure you've turned off your TV long ago, switch off from the ads, switch off from that saying you need this to make you happy, totally switch off from that. Yeah, we we, yes. we we are moving there, but but you're right. The mainstream is still very much about money, money, money. Yeah, that is the security idea, and you know we even talk about that with the law. I mean, the law, it, it, from from my point of view anyway, says that it's going to give you security. You know, there's always an outcome. You, you'll always see uh, it's certain, but it's not certain. Nothing is certain. H hoarding money doesn't mean it's certain you're still not going to necessarily, as as you just mentioned before, winning Tats Lotto. People, oh, if I only won Tats Lotto, everything would be different. No, you take yourself with you wherever you go. Your energy, your energetic makeup is with you and will respond to that situation accordingly. So, so suddenly, yeah, you have the guilt around the money. You need to divest it. No, all your friends don't like you anymore because you have money. So you start buying them things to show, oh, look, I'm wealthy. I can do all that. And then suddenly you have less than what you started with because that is your pattern of attraction. And be, the idea of, oh, I just want a comfortable life that's certain. I want, or, or I've got to give this money to my children. I've got to work really hard so that I've got something to leave them. Why? Let them earn their own money, let them stand on their own two feet, let them live, let them have their experiences. I mean, money is an experience, it's all the experiences as well that surround that. But if you're trying to keep other people safe, uh, you're trying to keep yourself safe, that is such a, it is a negative fear-based energy. I need to keep myself safe rather than I am safe. If you feel that shift in your own energetic field right now by saying I'm unsafe to I am safe, it feels different. And so you attract, you literally attract that to you. And that's really the way I've been living it. It is, it is a fun way. You know, you get curveballs now and then. That's yeah. the journey. Th that, that's, you know, th it, it, it's lively, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it, it, keeps you, it keeps you centered. It keeps you in the now. It keeps you in the now which is really important. And I think that, you know, we're talking about the, the messages that come from mainstream, talking about the, 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 what, what the mainstream tells us. Sorry, I've got traffic around me. What the mainstream tells us. Um, we've got to uh, think also about you know, how we're attached almost like an umbilical cord to um, the fear-based structures around money. And I'm thinking really of this whole idea of investing for the future. And you talked about that. You know, you've got to leave money for your children. We live in a society that um, focuses on pooling great amounts of money together. Uh, and the I'm, I'm talking about the funds industry, uh, pension funds, superannuation. Um, we... What happens is that we feel like we have to hoard that money so that you know we can retire safely and and happily. Um, that actually, if that's our mindset, is creating um, stagnation of of the energy of money. And I'm not saying pull all of your money out of your pension fund and and go spend it happily. But I'm saying if, if you're constantly kind of checking your balance or you're trying to work out how much you're going to retire with, you know, that's, that's fear-based. And it's also, it's also um, creating the hoarding mentality. We've got to actually collectively as a society stop seeing money as a thing um, and start seeing money as we touched on this as a flow. We've got to stop seeing money as the thing to hoard. Uh, we've got to stop making, trying to make money out of money because that, that 
that means that we're saying money is a commodity in itself. It's not. We use money to get things. So as we move into the future, we're going to have to start to, um, if we're going to, if we do have excess money, which is like excess energy to do things, right? We're going to have to start to be more clever with the money that we um, that we do end up pooling together. So let's say you and I uh, had a common intention uh, to build something. Now that would take money. I see it as a positive step that you take your excess money and I take my excess money and we we you know decide to invest it in let's say a third person's enterprise or business, right? Um, and and what we then do with our money is we don't just put it into a pension fund and want X percent growth a year. We care about what that third person is doing. We we really look into, you know, oh, okay, uh, you're growing this enterprise um, that's going to create beautiful art. You know, you're an artist. You, you, so you appreciate, you know, art brings happiness to people. Yeah. And so you and I care about the money that we're putting in and that money represents our energy there's a bit of us that goes into that money and then that money creates art and creates happiness etc 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 rather than pooling our money putting it you know saying i need to be safe um i want to retire when i'm 60 um and i need that so much in the, in the bank and then what happens to that money that we're pooling with lots of other people it goes it goes and it buys a big building in the CBD somewhere or, or it invests in a bunch of businesses that are doing all sorts of things. Who knows? Who cares? And we're actually starting to see the rise of consciousness in people about what their money is doing, which is part of this awakening. People are starting to care. People are starting to choose superannuation funds that don't invest in tobacco or weapons or whatever they they don't agree with um and they're saying because that's not building what i want a and the next step is for people to begin to on a mass level um invest their money into positive things not just negatively cut out things but then choose uh what we call it impact investments right not just negatively screen things out, but impact invest. And then, you know, from there, it's going to to uh, grow into a closer association like the one I was talking to you about, you know, where you and I actually know the, the person who is creating the art. And, and the closer we get towards, towards a place where the, the money represents energy to do good things, the better off we will be as a society, the further away we will get from that control, the, the money representing control over us. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen, to extend on that, I've seen, uh, for example, philanthropists engage, putting money into research projects, but it's still, it's like love, it's conditional love. And it says, yeah. okay, I want, I want research, I want you to research this, but I want the result to look like this so that I can then make more money so I can sell a product or something like that. This is, it is, what you're saying is that the energy that goes into the delivery of the money will be the outcome. As David Hawkins says, it's, you know, the, the level of consciousness of the, of the person engaging or giving will be the result of the level of consciousness that comes out the other end. And I think that's why we perhaps would be, uh, would be valuable for us to have a look at if you're receiving money for any from any investors and that kind of thing, what is their level of consciousness? What are they yeah. expecting from you? Is it conditional love they're giving you, like our parents did? You know, be good and um, and I will love you. <laughs> but you've got to do it my way. I've got to have control over this rather than collaborating and saying, well, let's genuinely see where it flows from here. Like I have I have money that's coming in with an energy of love. I'm, bring, I'm giving it to you with love. For yeah, I wouldn't be investing in things that I didn't see as having a potential for love. So that's the way I see it. It's just a whole different. Um, if you have the excess money to do that with, you're touching on two really important things there that are quite close to my heart. One is this whole idea of philanthropy. Um, philanthropy, you have correctly identified, is rarely just giving. 
it it's giving with strings attached so uh, and we motivate it with with you know, tax deductions and and so on and so forth we motivate it with influence you know you give money you'll get influence not just um you have the a ability to check. invest let's just stand here with a novelty check and we're looking like we're oh look i'm just generously giving this money people very rarely do it anonymously and just for the good of all do they exactly as well they get positions on boards mm -hmm. they get a say in what that that organization that they give to might be doing uh they get invited to speak on something and so on and so forth so yeah philanthropy is isn't really out of the goodness of your heart right and the other th not always there are many people who just give <laughs> if freely but there are equally others who give with that mindset um and and the the other thing that you touched on that i really uh, feel very strongly about is philanthropy is like the the way to ease your guilt you know, it, it's like being being a complete rascal six days a week and then going to church and church. confessing your sins <laughs> i'll i'll make money whichever way i want and then i'll give some of it away and i'll feel better and that's that you know we we've had different sectors of of our economy for a long time so we have the public sector then we have the the private sector and then we have the not-for-profit sector and those things all do different things you know we if you want to feed the hungry that's not the business of a, a big corporate that's the business of charity you know so so yeah. that's big corporates get to do what they like six days a week and then they'll give some money to the charity and they'll feel good mm. that's the equivalent like i said of going to church and confessing your sins so what we what is is and this is getting into a bigger conversation but it's associated with money it's that view that um all things that create money uh, should be doing so for the betterment of the planet and humankind that comes first you know and and uh, if you want to be an enterprise if you want to be a business and you want to be sustainable you need to be helping the planet and helping others in a way that makes money not making money uh and then fixing the stuff that is a consequence of making money so this is purpose before profit and it makes no sense to have large companies doing whatever they like and then having to have their excess money mop it up why create the mess in the first place everybody should be working for the betterment of the planet and humankind no mess you know we're just yeah. we're just growing evolving all the time and what does money do money flows around helping that money flows around it takes the resources and this is why money is so helpful you know money we haven't yet found a way of measuring value yet as a yeah. as a as other a than money That's other it. than money yeah you know I money helps us allocate yeah. 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 Uh, yeah yeah my idea about money is that it needs to it needs to integrate that love element into it so i have an idea about money you know that will help businesses uh allocate it differently but right now what does money do money helps us measure it money helps us choose money helps us reward people so money is super useful you know we we know these functions of money it's a store value it's a unit of accounting it's a medium of exchange it allows all of those things so money has although it's got a history of control attached to it it has all of these very useful things that it does um and so if we change the whole uh structure of how money is made uh we would go a long way towards towards uh you know creating a, a society where money doesn't cause harm money is only used for positive and my idea around money is that every dollar that we spend right now is it only incorporates in it um the cost that's on the books so so if i earn something uh, you know through my legal practice 
um, that profit reflects the expenses of my practice. And the expenses of my practice are things like the electricity, uh, the computer, the, the website, the server fees, whatever. And those things don't properly incorporate or integrate into them the impact. So, so I could get my electricity from anywhere. You know, right now, I could get it from a dirty coal plant, although that's reducing, or, or, or I could get it from a solar panel on the top of my roof. But, but you know, the dollar that I earn from my practice doesn't reflect those choices. So the cleaner, better for the planet avenue would be to get it from the solar energy. Uh, so my idea around money is that it should reflect the impact. So if I earn, I might earn a hundred dollars, um, but that hundred dollars is is you know kind of agnostic towards the ex what we call externalities of the money that's been spent on the the expenses. If we brought externalities into our accounting methods, we would begin to see the true cost of things. And it's actually you know, there have been, there has been work done around um, the true cost of of certain businesses um, in bringing on board externalities and many businesses like mining companies, for example, that we look at wouldn't actually be truly profitable if they brought all of their externalities onto their books. Mm -hmm. So my idea would be that eventually. Uh, we're, we're a clever bunch. I mean, we're a clever species, yeah. actually. We can figure out a lot of things. Yeah, we and, got from horse and cart to Tesla. So, you know, <laughs> I think we're doing pretty good. <laughs> yeah, we could figure out a way to, to make every dollar impact adjusted. So that mm. you know, I, could, I could then understand if I invested my money into, going back to our story about investing, if I invested my money into X company, I would, you know, right now I'd get back like a thousand dollars, but it could be a thousand dirty dollars. Who knows, right? I might be investing in a blood diamond company, yeah. um, and then or I could spend that money and get a thousand dollars. I could spend that money in into a, um, um, a a green company or you know a B corporation, and then I get back a thousand dollars, and that thousand dollars is clean shall we say or green and so in the future i could i could see uh, if we impact adjusted that i would understand um that if i invested in the blood diamond company i wouldn't be getting any impact adjusted dollars back at all uh that would be a loss making company but if i invested in the b corporation um i my thousand dollars might actually have a purchasing power of a hundred thousand dollars so that's, that's what I think we could eventually get to. It's a systemic change. I would love to see it. Um, but, you know, just imagine because then we would, you know, we would, we will eventually, Virginia, and I think this is where you would go to, we will eventually not even need money at all, right? But we're still here in this yeah. 3D space, physical space, playing with each other, making things and producing things and having the fun of running businesses. Running business is fun. Yeah, um, exactly. So money helps us do all of that. Eventually we'll move beyond that. But while we're here, you know, let's let's make money more meaningful. You know, let's make money and reflect think, yeah, us and better. I think it reflect us. That's it. And I think what, yeah, I love exactly what you're saying. But what's happening is people can't externalize the value of the B company, for example. So, you know, if I, I want you to think that I'm successful. So I will buy the, the most expensive handbag and I'll walk down the street with that handbag. So you say, oh, yeah, she's got money. But if I'm investing in a green co corporation, no one can see that. And until we change the way we where we place our value, what's cool, as I, as I said, once upon a time, smoking was really cool, you know, and I was a smoker. I love smoking and I couldn't be without it. And I'd go to a party and don't tell me I can't smoke. But there was something about the non-smokers eventually that I think, oh, you know, I think I want to be over there. I, I want to do what they're doing. And, you know, at the moment, they're pretty uncool. 
But if we're making that the cool way to be, it's just a way of being, changing that, how I feel about me when I'm doing this. And there's less value placed on me walking down the street with the most expensive handbag. Uh, you know, even, and I feel a little bit that that is shifting. That's oh, just yeah. like externalizing that wealth is less attractive. It's it's like, why are you doing that? You know, what do you need that for? I mean, that's no, there's nothing against beautiful things. That's art. There's a lot of art in many beautiful things, but the excess, you know, how many handbags do you need? Um, once upon a time, I needed a lot, but now I even struggle to use one. So I think, isn't that funny how I've shifted my way of, being about all of that. So, yeah, how do I want to impact the planet now? How can I help others uh, with my excess money if I have it and I will have enough to help others or be involved with, you know, even if it's just being involved in something that is evolving into the space is really valuable to me now. It makes, it fills me up. The handbag doesn't fill me up anymore, but being involved with those creators, the art, as you've just said, Geraldine, is my thing. But it doesn't matter who it is that's creating, we're all creators in some way, has great value to me. And I think when, yeah, that systemic change that you're talking about is shifting what we place value on as humans. Right now it's money, but I see that I see it shifting. I totally agree. And this is where uh, I I like to look around and see the positives. Uh, so the work that I do, I see it. Uh, so I work in impact investing. I represent companies that are seeking that are, are seeking to make an impact as well as seeking financing. And the message that they're getting very strongly is that there is a lot of investment out there or investors out there who are keen to make pure impact, not the sort of impact we were talking about earlier, which is the conditional impact. There is a lot of um, there are a lot of new investors. Uh, the the Canva company, the the, the yeah. co-founders are an example. Atlassian, the co-founders, they are a big example. They are young people. This the youth are really pushing this. Young people who uh, don't just care about the planet. Full stop. Care about people. Yeah, full stop. They do. And th there is they, a, there is a big difference in the next generation. I see that. Yeah, and the powerful yeah. thing about them is that they're beginning to un understand or they already understand you know i think we're the ones who are beginning to do things i think that they fundamentally understand <laughs> they've done it doing yeah it. They, they just get it um uh, they understand things like it's systemic it's structural so the atlassian co-founders do things for example this is touching on legal uh they do things like when they invest in companies they have a standard term sheet uh, that that is just they consider it fair uh, you know, and I've had a look at their standard term sheet. I think it is fair in terms of what uh, warranties that they require from the company that they're investing in. You know, in the standard standard sale of business agreement, if I am buying your company, I want full set of warranties. I want you to stand behind saying that, you know, uh, my books are, are fair and true and I have so many customers. I'm delivering this to you. Everything is clean. There's no litigation full set of warranties and if i if any of that's untrue i'm going to have to pay you back some money uh, that's a standard business sale of business agreement the atlassian founders when they do business they have a just because they're buying a company doesn't mean that they exert their bargaining power onto the other side they issue a fair term sheet that says we understand you know, where you're coming from, we will only ask you for warranties around things that we really care about, not 10 pages of what our lawyers Warranty, think you, we yeah. should ask for. And, and, uh, and therefore, let's just get over the legal part. Let's not spend a month negotiating our agreement. Let's just, you know, have a fair contract, get over it so that we can move on to our partnership and build something. Yeah. So that's that. So they are definitely seeing the interconnection of things. They they understand there's no point spending money on a bunch of lawyers who are going to sit in a room and argue with each other and charge by the hour. Money, um, money. <laughs> we're we're going to get on to the things that matter. Yeah, and that's that's also what's happening, say, in the legal systems. Is that unfortunately there are many lawyers out there that prolong <laughs> litigations for the sake of earning money. It's not in the highest or, or, or most benefic um, 
the greater benefit for all concerned in the litigation. It is for their own pocket to please their shareholders. And that was apparent to me very recently. And, and I thought, gee, this is sh shocking. A lot of people don't realise that is the reality. There are many yeah. beautiful lawyers out there, but I'm just saying there's a, there's a lot that perpetuate your litigation for the sake of earning money out of you. And, I mean, maybe you need to learn that too. You know, we're, we're all in a situation for a reason. But there is that, exactly what you're saying. So what are we in here for? Are we here to make money? And this is the other thing about the money. What are we here to do to create? We are all creators. We're yes. creating all the time. You, you just don't realise what you're creating. Half of, half of the population don't re realise what they're creating, but you are creating something all the time. But if you're here with a vision to create something beautiful, loving, the money follows you. You, it yeah. is the, the abundance happens after that. So it's just what is the goal here? If you go out with the goal to make money, why? Because I need money. No, you don't need to make money. You need to create something beautiful, something that's beneficial, something to enhance the planet, something to evolve us. And what's so interesting about going back to the youth uh, and going back to that shift that you were identifying is that there are a lot of young people i'm going to be generalizing here young people who say i do not want to uh, earn my money in a certain way or be associated with an employer who has this these certain values a and they're the ones who, who are insisting on change yeah. and taking risks you know the sort of risks that i was saying that my parents wouldn't want me to, to take they're going to work for startups uh, they're going to work for not-for-profits. They 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 want to align their lives with with meaningful impact, and so they're walking away from um, money in the traditional sense. Uh, and so I I actually think that what we're we're getting here is uh, people being motivated. You know, they may not be they may not be completely understanding why they are. Uh, they're being motivated. You know, they may not associate it with higher, associate it with higher consciousness or spiritual awakening, but they know fundamentally um, that they they feel better when they're doing something good, and they have that immediate empathy or or service to self mentality. That is where we're shifting to. And you're quite right. You, as you said earlier, Rather another point stress, I want to make. Yeah. It is that, yeah, we're all here for the experience, but I think more and more people are getting kind of tired of the experience of stress and working under conditions that are stressful and damaging the planet. I mean, we've had that. We've had that for as long as any of us can remember. We really want another experience now. We are more than ready. I had this beautiful young woman speak to me the other day and she said she had a part-time job in a certain store, which I won't mention, but she said as, as a staff member, she had to sell. And if she didn't make that sale, she had to write a report. So it's like, do anything to make the sale. It's like, that's ugly. And she, to me, it's fear-based. You're not going to make your targets. You're not going to do this. And I think law, many lawyers were in that space too, make targets, you know, your key performance indicators. You've yep. got to live up to a standard that's almost impossible most of the time. And they all know that so that you, you're under stress to keep working hard and achieve, achieve, achieve. But to get the money, to, it's like the, the carrot's up there, the golden ring's there. But actually, no, the golden ring's right here. Uh, how do I feel right now? What am I doing that feels good to me? That is the place to be in. That's where you animate the the good feeling thing, the abundance for you right now, rather than the fear of it's out there somewhere. And I tell you what, if you keep chasing it, you'll never get it. And what's so interesting about uh, what's happening in our society is that different parts of our society, even the legal and regulatory side of things, <laughs> are recognising that um, motivating people with money to in their jobs has terrible side effects and you know so we're actually getting to a point where where we're saying we don't want to motivate them with money because we don't want those side effects case in point case in point is the banking sector so remember the royal commission that we had a few years ago where where people were being motivated by money to perform in a certain way
to perform in a certain way. Um, they were actually uh, then you know, causing risk to their companies, to the banks that are working on financial institutions, because they were behaving in ways that were damaging to the customer and damaging to the reputation of those uh, institutions. And to such an extent that the regulators began to take interest, right? So then we had this whole conversation around how you reward people. And we had this conversation around reputational risk and non-financial risk, which is exactly what you're talking about, except it was expressed in terms that you know people were comfortable with in the mainstream. But it's exactly <laughs> yeah, exactly. this. It's exactly that that people should not be paid to create hardship for their customers. It it took it took a very expensive the Royal Commission <laughs> for us to get to that very basic truth. Uh, yeah. And even the, the um, Justice Hain, when he issued his, his report, he said there are just some basic things that businesses should know. That, you know don't lie. You know, be fair and reasonable. If you're going to make money out of a person, tell them you're, how you're making that money. You know, don't have a conflict of interest. All of these don't, don't engage in misleading or deceptive conduct. And he set out these very, very basic things. If you read them, you think, oh my God, an eight-year-old could tell you that. Yeah, I know. That's what I think. It's, it's so simple. Why do we have to mislead someone to get them to buy? To me, the idea of marketing something, because, yeah, look, we've all got a service or something we're offering. To me, I even sat with this idea of marketing the other day. I thought, no. No, I'm not going out there saying I do this and I do that and if you don't do what I, I have to offer, you're going to miss out because that's basically, you know, wrinkle cream. Yeah, if you don't buy this, you're not going to look like you're 12 years old and, you know, it's and it, it's still full of misleading content and I cannot believe we still are so gullible as a society to look at that. I think it was Amazon that said people, their customers are quite stupid really because they just you can sell them anything and I thought that's really appalling. <laughs> but but that, that's it. When it's so obvious to me, why, when is that going to be obvious to everybody? I don't know. Yeah, the awareness uh, is starting. So, so what's interesting about um, let's say let's choose another product that is it, it, is very popular these days, with, especially with social media, and that's fast fashion. So mm -hmm. there are some people who are getting addicted to fast fashion. Oh, my goodness, this dress only costs five bucks. Mm -hmm. And then they go buy it, buy it, and they don't care or it doesn't fit properly or whatever. I'll just buy another dress that costs whatever, 10 bucks. A and they're not realizing, because it's cheap, and again, they're motivated by money, they're not realizing what that actually means when they spend 10 bucks on a dress. They don't realize, and this is another area that I work in, they don't realize that all the way down the line, it means that somebody's getting paid very little money and working in horrible conditions to make that dress for you. Now, you, you know, we can go back to, to previous conversations where we said that might be a, a choice on the person, on the part of the person who's actually engaged in those sweatshop conditions. But, you know, in a society that, that is trying to move towards improvement for everybody, why would you want to spend your money buying something that is being made by somebody in misery it is, it's unbelievable i did i see this i went to i think it was at christmas time i i went into some of these stores we hadn't been in for a while and i thought oh yuck it's like there's clothes piled up it's just like an excess a gluttony there was some idea of this ugliness to me i thought this is a reflection of us look at us and we're grabbing at things and it's a mess and i thought when will everyone just see that? And it's, and yes, it is. Uh, I, you know, I buy things from cheaper stores too because I, I don't have to have an expensive label. There's nothing about that. But it just seems to me to be the yeah, keep pushing this at the consumer because yeah, that has no value really. None of it has any value. You just like get it, throw it away, and it fills up the earth. It, it, when are we appreciating? See, someone made this. Their yeah. time went into that. Where did the love come in? When did can we just buy one beautiful shirt that will last us for a while and feel beautiful in it? You know, when will that happen? Can we change that? Can we give some value to that instead? It's totally happening, though. I mean, I had a conversation with my sister a week ago where we were talking about op shopping. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, there's no way I'd walk into a Vinnie's. 
Oh, no, no oh, that, yeah, poor that. people do that. You know, <laughs> yeah. but now it's a, it, it's not about being rich or poor. It's about yeah. why should yeah. I go and buy something? You know, when there's beautiful, we call them pre-loved, but there's beautiful existing garments, that are lovely. garments out there, right? And it, it is what what do I want? I think yeah. people have forgotten that what do you actually want? What do you want to look like? What do you, what's your style? Where's your authenticity? You don't have to keep looking like the woman on Instagram. It's, exactly. They're selling exactly. you. They're tricking you. They're yeah. tricking you. So all and of this awareness yeah. is totally happening to people. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's not tiny steps. Like I actually think we're, we're starting to snowball. The only thing, and we come back to this, Every time you and I talk, whether it's about money or family law, yeah. the only thing, no, well, it's not the only thing, but a very big thing <laughs> that's holding us back are the structures. You know, like, so we need the banks that are going to be more about, about engaging in the flow rather than trying to make money out of money. We need the laws that are going to be about motivating impactful business rather than judging people, judging businesses by their bottom line and so on and so forth. And But it does come from the change from the consumer. If I yeah. start saying I want something different and so many, of like the lawyers would shift the way they did law if everyone said, no, I don't like what you're doing. I want yeah, a lawyer it, who does this. Then, oh, well, we'll accommodate you then. Okay, so it does take each of us, I, I also say, before we can reflect the change in the external. It's got to be for each of us to say, yeah, look, you know, I don't place value on that anymore. I'd rather, yeah, go to Vinny's and get something recycled that is individual, reflects me, and I feel good in that. And this is about me now, not about you <laughs> and what no. you tell me I want. I'm not that gullible anymore. Yeah. yeah. So there, there, there's a lot that we've covered, and I think that there are principles to live by. Uh, we all fall back into traps because, as you said, you know, it's all the messaging around us. But learning to trust, disassociating from the fear messaging of money, making conscious decisions around how we spend our money and how we invest our money, uh, making conscious decisions around how we earn our money, all of that is going to bring us forward and just yeah. you know respecting respecting the changes also i think uh, celebrating the changes that that we're seeing you know and just celebrating people like the conversation i had with my sister if someone comes to me and says something like that celebrate that you know say that's so wonderful yeah. what we're doing make make ourselves feel good for embracing us, and, and participating in the changes yeah. Yeah, we all have a say. We all have a say. We just need to say it. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't been saying it. We just haven't been saying it. We haven't been saying, look, I don't actually want to wear that garment or I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to have the latest handbag. It's just too much stress. That is stressful to me. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather do something else, yeah. And think about the messaging. I mean, we're coming up on a, we're in an election uh, period right now in Australia. And, you know, the messaging that comes to us is we need more jobs, we need more jobs, we need more jobs, we need to grow the economy. And understand that that's messaging being fed to us, which is part of this consumerist mindset. Why do we need to grow the economy? Actually, if I go to an op shop and I buy something that's already used, that is not going to grow the economy as much as if I go and buy something completely new or if someone gives me something, it doesn't grow the economy at all because it doesn't get included in the way we measure growth of the economy. So we need to understand that integrated into all of the political messaging uh, and you know the news media is growth, 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 which is all about spending money that money. we don't need to spend. spend. Why aren't we doing personal growth? Why aren't we being taught to personally evolve? That would yeah. be ideal. But then what happens is they're divesting, it's a divesting of power. We're de decentralising power. And I don't exactly. think that's going to be endorsed by government. But that's yeah. another story. Uh, yeah. This this topic of money is huge. Um, so I think that's all I have to say today uh, as well, Geraldine. I think we've nearly been speaking for an hour. So mm -hmm. that time goes so fast because we have so much fun when we're talking about these things. But that yeah, did you have anything else to add before we go? No, uh, I really enjoyed it. It actually did go really fast. And there was yeah. just, <laughs> uh, we touched on so many things. 
But yeah, yeah. thank you so much. That's it. And next month, I think we're going to talk about is it crime? Yeah, the law of one and crime, crime and how. Yeah, that's a, just another diverse topic because it's all the same across the board. It's all energy, everybody, the way I see it. We're all connected. Um, yeah, we talk about flow and we'll talk about crime next time. So thank you all for uh, contributing today and joining in. It's been great. And we'll see you next month on Law of One. Bye now. Bye.